Hey, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mehmet Ali. I'm Director of Academic Services here at Air University, and I want to thank uh, everyone that joined us here in the audience today, as well as uh, are going to watch this on, uh, on, on uh, is it Facebook Live or one of those favorite places that we like to look at. This is being recorded. We can see this again. Please, so please share this. Today we have a great um, uh, a speaker uh, and a, a panel afterwards. Uh, on innovation and design, one of the key features of Air University. So first up, we are uh, very happy to welcome Dr. Mark Katz, who's here uh, from uh, Medical University of South Carolina. Dr. Katz is the chief of cardi cardiothoracic surgery at the Medical University and a pioneer in robotic health surgery, heart surgery, sorry. He uh, received a combined MD and MPH from Tulane University School of Medicine uh, and completed residencies in general surgery, uh, cardiothoracic surgery, and pediatric car cardiac surgery. Dr. Katz uh, performed the first combined heart kidney transplant in the eastern U.S. and continues an active practice in adult cardiac surgery. Uh, specializing in minimally invasive transcatheter and robotic approaches uh, for valve disease and surgery for congestive heart failure and heart transplantation. Uh, he is a highly sought after subject matter expert in not only medicine, but and he will talk about medicine of course today, but uh, the real reason we are welcoming Dr. Katz is, is for some is innovation. Uh, and so he's a, uh, an expert in human-centered design uh, having participated in participated in the Stanford Medical X uh, Medicine X workshop, uh, together with the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, so very much happy to welcome Dr. Mark Katz. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. The uh, seeing what's here at the Air University and at, at Maxwell Air Force Base. Uh, think will help me sleep better at night when I think about a lot of the things going on in the world and I appreciate everything that's done by the folks here and their their strong efforts to keep us all safe. So I, I know many of you may have just eaten lunch, had a big meal and um, suddenly you may s start feeling a fullness in your chest and notice heart rate is going up a little bit. You're not sure what's going on and you're starting to worry. This could be something serious. <coughs> or it could just be that you ate too much for lunch. But for almost a million Americans every year have a heart attack. And it starts them on an endless journey of various diagnoses, medical procedures, in many cases for a lifelong, ER visits, office visits, testing. And the question is, how is our medical industrial complex doing and working with our patients? Is it, are, are we actually getting the messages across that we need to? Are patients getting what they want out of the system? So for hundreds of years, the uh, physician-patient relationship uh, saw the physician as an authoritative, sometimes dictatorial healer, uh, the unquestioned expert on care, protocols, and medical regimens. But recently, my eyes have been opened to some different perspectives. Uh, searching through the internet in the middle of the night one night, I flipped across a, medicine a, a meeting called Medicine X. This was back in 2011. It was the first program that was being put on by Stanford to connect stakeholders in innovation, in healthcare, in technology, and see what that intersection was between emerging technologies and medicine. The first, medic uh, first Medicine X that I went to, which was their first program, got to meet Ann Wosicki. She was the CEO and co-founder of 23andMe. This gentleman was there, Sergey Brin, one of the founders of Google, was at that first meeting. But the thing that was more surprising to me than ev even those two incredibly accomplished people is that this meeting included patients. This is Sarah Kucharski, 
who does a lot on social media. And there were 20% of the participants at this meeting were patients, not just in the audience, but presenters as well. And I'd never been to a medical meeting where patients were involved, especially as presenters. The variety of people that I got to meet from that, this is Kim Petty, who was involved with the founding of Xperia Healthcare and uh, Vocera with Bridget Duffy, who's become a friend for many years. Uh, and, and they, Bridget was the first chief innovation officer at the Cleveland Clinic. And I'm gonna mention her as we go along with a, what, a lot of the innovative ideas that she have com com has come up with in how we can improve healthcare and how we can improve the uh, interactions. The other thing that, that I was fortunate to get to experience during this was a visit to IDEO. IDEO is based in Palo Alto. It's a design firm that takes human-centered design-based approach to dealing with organizations and innovating. It helped Steve Jobs uh, develop the first mouse. They helped develop the Palm Pilot. They helped the OXO company develop a food whisk where the tines don't cross down at the apex so that it's easier to clean. Come up with uh, the insulin pen. Uh, a whole host of different widgets, for example, to make life better on a daily basis. But they also work with processes, and that's their biggest uh, foray into the healthcare area. And we got to spend a, a day there with them working with us to help us understand what their approach is to human-centered design and how they come up with a problem, to have a problem and dissect it and try to come up with a, a new solution that may not have been thought of otherwise. This is Aaron Gilmer, who was part of the group that I was split up with at that first meeting at uh, IDEO and she had a, a patient with a chronic medical problem. And one of the things that she brought up with her problem was, she said, many times when I go to a doctor's office and have an appointment, I leave knowing that that doctor just did not get it. That we just didn't connect and the problem I was going in to see them about just really never, never got across. And since meeting her, I now, when I see patients in the office, I ask them at the end, did I get it? Did I answer your questions? Did we address the issue that you were here to see me for today? So again, as part of this IDEO challenge, we were working on different ways to do uh, problem solving and learning their techniques. Many people have seen pictures of these post-it notes. This was my first interaction with them. And the idea is basically to look at problem solving almost like a funnel is how I like to think about it. The initial ideas can be far-fetched, no constraints of finances. You don't even have to have constraints of the physical laws of the universe necessarily. You can say, I want to solve the problem of patients getting transported across the hospital in one of those gowns where their rear end is sticking out and how can we solve that? And, we, and somebody can come up with the idea, well, let's make a hospital that revolves around the patient. Great first idea, it goes down on a post-it note, it gets put up on the board. And by doing this, you eventually come up with more and more ideas and basically funnel things down into something that may actually be practical, something that you can prototype, which is a big part of this, being able to come up with a model whether it be real or virtual, and then a story to tell. Empathy is a big part of this, being able to understand what the problem is from the standpoint of the person who's experiencing it. Design, coming up with different ideas of how can we address this problem. So empathy, design, ideation, prototyping, testing, and then reiterating over and over and we spend a day doing that. And I can tell you, having done that program for six years, been able to be one of the instructors for the last uh, three years of that, when I left that, my right brain hurt. As a typical left brain person, you did not have to try and think in these different ways. Uh, it really opened new worlds to me and has helped me think about multiple problems in a slightly different way.
And so I started on this journey of how I would learn to get it and how I could learn some, take some of these lessons that were presented to me by the folks at IDEO and the people who organized the Medicine X meeting and get it and learn how to change my practice. So this is where I was as the initial prototypical surgeon when I started this journey. The overall goal was to become like this gentleman. Those of you who are too young in this audience may not recognize Marcus Welby, but he was uh, a TV character who epitomized the kind, caring, grandfatherly family physician. As a cardiac surgeon, however, many patients are too intimidated to speak freely to me. And Aaron's just, you know, did I get it? Did the doctor get it? Really opened my eyes to my having to find a new way to interact with my patients. So if I started like a raging hulk and wanted to get to be Marcus Welby, I suspect I'm somewhere around here at this point but still continuing down this journey and doing what I can to continue to help with the connection and to improve people's lives. So there's really, when you think about medicine and treatments and what can be done, there is nothing more important than quality data showing the results of our patient care decisions. What we need is a consistent data set. We need actionable items. We need uh, core metrics that we can follow to know that what we're doing is appropriate. So we're measured more on metrics, paid more on metrics, and included or excluded from programs these days, especially insurance companies based on metrics, some of which are valid, some of which may not be. One thing that's been noticed is through a variety of peer-reviewed studies that guideline-directed medical therapy can work. Variations in care outside of the guidelines is appropriate under certain circumstances, but variations frequently lead to variations in outcomes. Intuition, which was a cornerstone of decision making, has its place, but rarely outperforms database decision making. This is Glenn Steele. When I met him, he was the CEO of Geisinger clinic. Uh, he is an innovative. He was an, onco an oncologic surgeon. He had a lot of input into the debates that were going on about the Affordable Care Act. And his mantra was no unjustified variations in care. Not everybody's going to fit into the boxes. And there may be times when things have to deviate, but the protocols should be followed. The baseline peer-reviewed data needs to be followed. So in addition to the importance of data for providers, patients these days have more access to data and are more well-informed than ever before. This is Hugo Campos. I met him at the first Medicine X meeting. He had an episode of sudden death. He had an internal defibrillator placed because it was found out that his episode of sudden death was due to a rapid heart rate and had a defibrillator placed, so should that ever happen again, this defibrillator would be there to cardiovert his heart back into a normal rhythm. He wanted some of the information from his defibrillator. He wanted to know what his heart was doing on a regular basis. You know, was he ever actually close to needing the defibrillator to go, go off? And he, that started him on a number of years long battle to get information about this device, which at that time cost around $30,000, and he wanted the data from it, and no one would give it to him. He wanted to be able to correlate what his activities were, what foods he ate, uh, other, other aspects of his life with these rhythm disturbances, because he obviously did not want that to happen again. Yet the system was not allowing him to get the data about his own body with a device that he bought. So patients, in many ways, are really mini experts in themselves. And I began to realize that from all of these interactions and these discussions with folks is that many times what we need to do is just ask the patient. We can't just assume that we know more in, in every scenario. And so one of the things that I began to do is how do I apply these lessons? How do I apply what I'm learning from these patients who have dealt with the 
a larger aspect of the medical system and came away with what are some very realistic and valid criticisms. What could I do to make my practice, my group, better? So for two years, I kept saying, we need to re-engineer re the patient experience. But I really had no idea where to start. Mark Twain said, you can't depend on your eyes when your imagination is out of focus. And so finally, having been to Bridget Duffy's Xperia Roundtables, the Medicine X meetings, I decided to plagiarize her humanizing health care and started a project that we called Humanizing Heart Care in our local group. What, one of the other things, having learned from uh, the trip to IDEO, was the book that was written by the founders called Creative Confidence. And they spoke about a lot of the issues that are involved with coming up with new and innovative ideas, how to look at a problem from a slightly different perspective. Um, many people may be uh, aware of a, a, a test that's used here called 30 circles, where you're given a, a piece of paper with 30 circles and asked to do something with them. Some people will draw faces within the circles. Some people will connect the circles. But everyone's got a slightly different tilt on it. One of the things that I always like to ask is how many people have a refrigerator? How many people have kids? How many people have a refrigerator that's covered with kids' art? Right? Every child feels free and comfortable drawing things, and they feel that they are Picasso or Michelangelo, and everything that they made is great. However, when you're at suddenly an adult, not many people are still drawing things. Some people who have a particular talent in art, but if I asked you to sit down and each draw a picture of the person sitting next to you and then showed them that picture, there would be laughter throughout the room. And most of that laughter is embarrassment because people are concerned about how someone feels about what they created. So there's a, there's a great TED Talk. It's actually one of the most downloaded tech talks of Sir Ken Robinson called Do, Do Schools Kill Creativity? And so kids have a tremendous talent, but what happens once they start their schooling? And the current schooling system worldwide in many ways teaches the creativity out of students. There's an example that he gives during that talk of a teacher in England who had both Paul McCartney and George Harrison in his music class and failed to recognize any musical talent in either of them. So there it does need to be a change. There is this graph that shows that you know more, more formal years of schooling ends up with less creative people. So again, having studied design thinking via uh, David and Tom Kelly's Creative Confidence book, we recognize the first step is ideation. It's the process of forming and relating ideas. Prototyping, evaluating, reiterating, as I mentioned, all part of the overall process that these gentlemen have started. I also looked at Apple, and there was a uh, Harvard Business Review article this was prior to Steve Jobs' death, about Steve Jobs and the Eureka myth, it was called. Because everyone thought that he just woke up in the middle of the night with that light bulb over his head, ah, let's make an iPod. But that's not how these things happen, even for, for geniuses like that. Thomas Edison said, genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. Inspiration is for amateurs. The rest of us just show up and get to work is actually a more appropriate quote. So in the book on creative confidence, they talked about a class at Stanford where uh, people were given a sculpture class where the students were given, broken up into two groups. One group was told to make the single best piece of sculpture they could that entire semester. The other group was told to make as many pieces of sculpture as they can through that semester. And the group that actually made multiple pieces of work were the ones who ended up with the pieces of art that they were most proud of and came out the best. The ones who were just pushing and trying to make a single great piece 
had many more problems. Linus Pauling said, if you want a good idea, start with lots of ideas. There are a lot, many different ways to look at patterns and problems and get a fresh idea from that. Creativity requires change from just say no to just do it. Defer judgment, say yes. Here's 50 phrases that kill creativity. We, it came up in our discussions earlier today. One of the most common ones are, we've always done it that way. It's not working, but we've always done it that way. We're not gonna change things. Or I'm not saying you're wrong, but, or it's too much work, or let me give it some more thought. So someone comes into their, uh, to their superior with a great idea, and the next thing you know, it's been squashed. So creative, creativity and the methodology were, are an evolution in many ways. So for example, most Apple products existed before Apple made them. The iPod was not the first MP3 player. The iPhone was not the first telephone. It took the, uh, took the iPod, took the telephone, were able to put it together. There are ways of reapplication of looking at things that are old in a new way. This is one that's particularly of interest to me in medicine. This is an MRI machine. The engineer who built the MRI machines went into a hospital one day and saw the child who's, who was going in there for a scan hysterically crying. And he felt horrified that this device that he made to help people was in many ways psychologically harming this child. So he came up with these decals to make the whole environment look like a, like a playground and help to help re relax this child so that they could have their scan without being traumatized. So the goal is to solve the problem, not implement any particular solution. So people don't want a quarter inch drill bit, people want a quarter inch hole. The question is, how do we help them get to that end game? The folks at IDEO start with the question, how might we, when they're working on problem solving? Empathy is the biggest part of it. Putting aside what you think is true and learning what's actually true, especially from another's perspective. So when I was told about patient-centered design, the despicable me part squawked, everything we do is patient-centered. But I've lear since learned from many of my friends, patients who are involved in these meetings that that is not necessarily so. Uh, Warner Slack from Harvard said, the least utilized resource in healthcare is the patient. So we uh, developed a, I had a co-pilot meeting uh, organized in Washington, D.C. with Nick Dawson and Claudia Williams, and Claudia was working for the Office of the National Healthcare Coordinator at that time, and we decided to use some of these products, uh, methods, and I brought, you know, three nurses and three patients with me to that, this meeting. We used the IDEO processes to help come up with what was the problem and what was the solution. You know, the biggest issue was about inconsistent communications. All these were three patients. One had a very short hospital stay, one had a chronic condition, one had a very complex hospital stay with a long term in the ICU. All said the biggest issue was inconsistent communication from most of the docs. So we idea used uh, prototyping and ideating. I try to recreate the hat of my OR nurse. And I got the hospital to agree that we can hire a co-pilot person to be the one who would help funnel all of the communication with families so that they didn't get a different story from the nurse in the ICU and a separate story from a consultant and a different story from the physician that day, all of whom were telling their version of the truth no one was lying, but what the patient got was a very mixed message. Now the co-pilot nurse, I, I got an agreement that we can have this FTE for a year if I could show an ROI. And after one year, we dropped length of stay, we dropped readmission rates, and handed out, uh, sent out patient satisfaction surveys and had improved patient satisfaction overall. Some other things that we've worked on was, and this came from Bridget Duffy, is the concept of informed hope. Of be, I can scare anyone out of having heart surgery, but am I helping them? Not necessarily. I want them to be informed about the risks and alternatives, 
but I want them to go into the operation feeling that they're comfortable and are going to be successful. They need the truth, but they also need to get the uh, procedures that will help them the most. Flip the Clinic was developed by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and others along the lines of uh, the Khan Academy's Flip the Classroom. The patients are given a set of cards with a variety of potential issues so that when they, they get intimidated and forget why they came in and don't uh, necessarily explain what their problem was to the doctor, they can flip through these cards while they're in the rating, waiting room and bring them in with them so that they don't forget to ask the doc about what they want. And then we developed a knowledge prescription where the, we can check off for the patients. Here are certain things we want you to do. They don't have to go to anyone to fill it other than helping them remember some of the important aspects of what your discussion was. So in conclusion, this is one of my favorite commercials of all time. Here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs in the square holes, the ones who see things differently. They're not fond of rules, and they have no respect for the status quo. You can quote them, disagree with them, glorify or vilify them. About the only thing you can't do is ignore them, because they change things. They push the human race forward. While some may see them as the crazy ones, we see genius. Because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. The nice thing about that iteration of that commercial is that was uh, Steve Jobs who did the voiceover as opposed to the actor who did the voiceover in the one that was actually uh, placed on TV. So in reality, there's a piece of crazy one in all of us, and we just need to unleash that potential. Margaret Mead said, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Katz, thanks very much for that uh, great presentation. Lots of different perspectives there. And uh, right now we're going to welcome uh, two other folks here from Air University who will uh, join Dr. Katz for a, a panel discussion about these ideas and more. So I'd like to welcome to the stage first uh, Professor Bill DeMarco, a retired colonel from the Air Force. He's the uh, Air University Chief of Innovation Development and runs the AUIX, the Office of uh, Innovation Accelerator, uh, holds three master's degrees. He works for me, and I didn't even know all this stuff. Uh, has fellowships from Stanford and Cambridge University. Uh, as a five-time commander, uh, leadership consultant, uh, teaches leadership here at AU as well as at University of Michigan and at Auburn University, and is also a TEDx speaker. Welcome. Uh, also joining us is uh, Colonel Jason Togatru, uh, as the Vice Commandant of the uh, Air University Squadron Officer School. Colonel True is a graduate of the U.S. Air Force Academy uh, and has held various operation and training assignments in the U.S. and Central Command. Uh, Colonel True has been a faculty member here at uh, the Air Command and Staff College and then served as Director of Operations. Uh, after completing the School of Advanced Air and Space Studies, he earned a PhD in the history of technology at Auburn University. And following his doctoral uh, studies, he served as commander of the 30th Student Squadron at SOS and dean at SOS, and is now uh, the vice commandant, as I said, and also a lead for the Think Tank Innovation Program. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. So, First, I want to say thank you for, for being here uh, and for naming your program Copilot because the aviator in me <laughs> loves that, so that's, that's good. You never had a Copilot. Yeah, yeah, but I never had one, but they sound neat. <laughs> so, uh, and thanks for everyone that made it out here today and, and who's uh, watching online, especially, uh, you know, you're a graduate of Tulane, and I think we have some people in the New Orleans healthcare system at Ochsner that are watching today as well. So, uh, real quickly for the flow, 
Uh, we'll, we'll have some conversations, some, some questions amongst us. But if anyone in from the audience has a question, please uh, stand up. You can either use the mic from the side or just voice your question and I'll repeat it so that people uh, on Zoom can hear it as well. So with that, I'll, Bill, I'll turn it over to you to uh, give your thoughts on what uh, Dr. Katz said and ask your question. Great, thanks, Toga. Um, you know, thank you, sir. Uh, it was a, a great talk. And what I find most interesting is the similarities because I think a lot of people might not see immediately the differences between the, or the similarities between the military and medicine. What, what is the same, what is different, and, and what I think is interesting, obviously, we both deal in life and death. Um, another thing you mentioned, the military industrial complex. I didn't ever thought about that. Of course, we have the military industrial complex. But one thing we both have is this bureaucracy. It's the idea that you know, we have to have 50 things signed, we have you know, 100 steps to get to something close to yes. Uh, I do a lot in the innovation space around Air University inside the Air Force, and the biggest frustration I see in our innovators is the fact that I have a great idea, but how do I get it through the bureaucracy? Have you seen that in MUSC or in the medical profession as well? Yeah, uh, tremendously. I think there's a, a slide that, that I like to show uh, that was put out by Athena a number of years ago, which showed that since 1975, it shows the curve of the number of uh, healthcare administrators climbing up over 3,200%, and the number of healthcare providers has been basically flat. Um, there are multiple reasons for this, and we obviously need the administrators to do a lot for what we do and to interpret laws and to help implement a variety of things, but there are more and more layers that are coming between what we may want to do and changes we may want to make and how we can get there. Um, and I think part of that, again, is our job to try and work within the system since we don't have m other choices. And unfortunately, the, the, the folks there are the ones with the checkbook. Um, and we've got to ha work and be able to show them through whatever our in innovation is, like with the co-pilot program, at least we got an agreement that if we can show an ROI on this position, it would be funded. And uh, that was probably seven or eight years ago now. I've been, I did that when I was in Richmond and that program is still going today. So I'm happy to see that. But yeah, I think there's a tremendous amount of similarities uh, between the administrative actions or the um, uh, bureaucracy that we have to deal with. And obviously uh, in the military, you have an even bigger bureaucracy to deal with. So my, my first exposure to design thinking was when I showed up at Squadron Officer School because it's part of our curriculum. And then thankfully, uh, I've been afforded the opportunity, just like Bill has, to go out to Stanford to their D school, their design school. And a as you mentioned, one of the things that their process starts with is empathy. And wh what I have found is that practicing, kind of living into this role as a designer, I. I have felt like those techniques have spilled over past a, you know, just the bounds of a project. So what I'm interested to know from you is in what ways do you see practicing the design skills? What ways have those spilled over in other aspects of your professional life? Especially leadership, since what we, we do primarily at Squadron Officer School is build leaders. Sure. Um, I've, you know, in, as a division chief, we've got a number of other surgeons, uh, allied professionals that we work with, the nursing staffs, have to learn how to help people understand what your vision is, where you wanna go, and what it takes to help everyone move in the same direction. Uh, empathy is the number one characteristic that I can see there, is trying to see what the perspective is on the others, why they're frustrated with the situation, why they may not be moving in the direction that you think maybe would be, would be better, or hearing from them why their direction is better. But it all starts with trying to put yourself in their shoes to see what the issue is. And, and is that resisted at all in the, in the medical field? Sure, because every doc thinks that they're smarter than everyone else and certainly smarter than I am <laughs> and that they can do it better than I can and that they should be sitting in my chair and not them. So yeah, absolutely, there's a lot of resistance, um, you know, we all go about things, get, we're all in situations, as you said, we deal literally with life and death on, on a routine basis, and that leads to stress. And many times we'll respond 
in those situations in ways that may not be the coolest or the smartest way to deal with things. And then, then the focus gets put on someone's behavior instead of on what there may have been their good idea and why there was a problem and what they need to fix. So number one starts internally in how can you present yourself better? How can you deal with stressful situations without losing your cool, without um, insulting people, and yet be able to transmit your ideas to them about a better way to do things, especially under difficult circumstances. And you both know about that very well. <laughs> so uh, design thinking, and you mentioned this idea that it's a human-centered design. You also had a slide that talked about patient-centered design. And I went online and, you know, of course, I Googled your name and I found some great articles from MUSC. And it talked about some of the robotics that uh, you've developed at, at MUSC. But my question is, as reading the article was, who is the human, human in that center design? Is the human the patient, or is the human the doctor? And then how do you parse between those two? Is, that, is there a, a tension there? Um, hopefully not a tension, but you're right that at times it's going to go back and forth. You know, ideally in patient-centered design, you know, our focus is on having someone who, who comes to us with, with a problem and what's the best solution we can formulate for them to get them back to their normal life and to get rid of whatever obstacles are there by their disease process. Uh, one of the things that I have found intriguing with robotic surgery, and I've been doing it for 20 years now, is the ability for people to recover quicker. I love to tell a story about a friend of mine when, when I lived in Richmond named Dick Kaspari, and he was one of the early originators in arthroscopic knee surgery. He helped develop some of the original instruments to be used there. He operated on Mary Lou Retton six weeks before the Los Angeles Olympics. If he had done her surgery through conventional means, she not only would not have won a gold medal, she wouldn't have even competed. So he was able to you know, take a new skill, use it on someone, and change their lives. Very good. Thank you. So if there is someone in the medical profession that comes to you and says, I'm, I'm new to design thinking, you know, where do I start? For us, you know, in the Air Force, we, we point at some of the things we go to. We go to Stanford, some of the things that we teach around here. Those are, those are good starting things. We get, maybe give them a book. I'm interested to know what you provide. Um, so we ha have a couple of copies of Creative uh, Confidence, both in my office um, and that the residents know that they can borrow and use and, and, and work with at any time. Um, we've talked about things like this. Unfortunately, you know, the Medicine X meeting um, it's, it, it lapsed for, uh, I think, a year, and then COVID hit, so I'm hoping that that'll get uh, re-energized, because I think that's a, a great starting place for people who are thinking about, uh, about some of these things. IDEO has some online uh, courses that people mm -hmm. can take to uh, help learn some of their theories and, and ways of thinking about uh, different problems. Yeah. In, in what ways have you uh, found that design thinking is not always the tool. Like, because obviously every tool we have has limitations. Uh, so is there any, any time that someone comes to you and says, hey, I want to approach this from a human-centered design perspective that you actually say, that's not actually the tool that's appropriate in this moment? Well, the biggest thing I think is a, is a time factor. You know, sometimes we have to make split-second decisions about how to deal with the problem. And you have to sometimes use creative solutions. That's Personally, one of the things I like about heart surgery is that not every instance is the same, and you may read something, and you've got to make things up while you're going along, and how, what's the best way to solve this? So there's no time at that, at that level, certainly, where you're making split-second decisions. As a pilot, you've got to make decisions immediately about what's happening. There, you don't have those luxuries. But I think in processes, in developing tools, you do have those issues. Um, I mean, I think, I guess the other area is interpersonal interaction where this may not fit as well as some other uh, means, uh, means of problem solving. So we talked earlier about um, Jim Collins' book, Good to Great. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's this, this thing that Collins has where he talks about hedgehogs and foxes. And of course, you can go back to ancient Greece and see that there's just really a sentence we have that says, the fox knows many things 
the hedgehog knows one big thing. Jim Collins says the hedgehog is the best CEO. And if you've read the book, a lot of those companies aren't around anymore. So this is my debate. <laughs> is it better to be a fox or is it better to be a hedgehog when it comes to things like design thinking, innovation, and what are you? Yeah, so it depends. I, it, it's, uh, I'm gonna waffle on that because I think you've gotta be able to, You've got to be able to take aspects of both. Um, I'm probably more of a hedgehog than a fox, but I think I try, I recognize certain things. I know some things very well, but yet I know there are situations when I've got to get other resources to help solve these problems that's outside of my realm, um, that you need to get consultants involved, that you need to have others to help solve a problem that's you know, out of your toolbox. Yeah, Isaiah Berlin had written about that, and then John Gaddis in his new book on strategy talks about it, and Gaddis basically says at the end that you need to be both, or at least you have to be connected to both. And right. so he kind of throws Jim Collins under the bus. But right. what, are, what are you, Bill? I'm uh, definitely a fox. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm a hedgehog wishing desperately to be a fox. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I love that distinction. Actually, I use that distinction with our students. That's how I start uh, my welcome address to the SOS class. You know, because they come to us very tactical, uh, very proficient in what they do, and we need them to start thinking more broadly about why what they do fits into the larger uh, perspective. So I do want to ask, is there anyone in the audience that has a question for Dr. Katz or, or Bill and I? So I think, uh, I'll, let me rephrase the question just so, because I'm on the mic. Sure. And tell me if I got it right. How does technology interact with the, the patient-centered design and, and how is that useful? Technology itself, how is it you know, maybe a means to human-centered design and maybe even a limitation, I would say, if you think of technology only in terms of hardware. Right, so from the hardware standpoint, a lot of the new develops, developments have come as a result of some of these processes. There's a device called the MitraClip, which is a transcatheter approach to fixing leaking mitral valves that came out of the Fogarty Institute with a lot of folks there with Stanford connections and the D school connections. Um, th that said, I mean, there has been incredible changes in the field of cardiac surgery in the last decade. It was sort of stagnant for a little while, and then there's a huge focus on less invasive and newer and transcatheter approaches to things. You know, we can replace an aortic valve with a needle stick now. You know, I've been in practice for 32 years. If you had told me that 30 years ago, I would have told you you were crazy. And those things are 100% uh, you know, better for the patient. Um, you know, the valve technologies are, are really remarkable. The ability for a patient to have their valve replaced and go home the next day is, is unbelievable. And some of these pe people who we know would not do well with open surgery are now able to get this therapy, which in the past never would have been available to them. But to me, actually, the biggest change that's occurred in medicine in the time I've been practicing is a result of some of those technologies. And when the transcatheter aortic valves came out, it was mandated that there be a heart team approach meaning that the patients had to be seen by both an interventional cardiologist and a cardiac surgeon ahead of time, and both have to participate in the procedure. So, I mean, I'm old enough that I was around when balloon angioplasty for coronary arteries first started, and there were literal arguments over patients about which treatment was better. The surgeons were saying they needed bypass surgery. The cardiologist was saying, I, I can just put a balloon in there and fix that. And there was no real joint work. Well, now the interventional cardiologist and I have a clinic every Tuesday afternoon where we see valve patients. And we literally send patients back and forth to each other. This patient would be better with surgery. This patient would be better with a transcatheter approach. And then we discuss them. We go over their studies together. And we have a meeting then Wednesday mornings with everyone in our area and present these patients, which is the best treatment for this patient. The patient is the winner in that. And that's been absolutely, without a doubt in my mind, the best development in medicine is that you, it's been mandated, you're not getting paid for that procedure unless both groups of, of uh, 
health care workers are together. No, yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of people in medicine and elsewhere who have strong feelings about their position. And sometimes you can't work with them. Sometimes you have to agree to disagree. And sometimes you've got to compromise. Um, and it's, I mean, that, that's what I was alluding to earlier. I think some of the human interactions, to me, are the hardest parts of these things. Uh, developing widgets is not an easy thing, but that's concrete. Uh, dealing with humans and, and emotions is much more difficult. Uh, and I wish I had the answer to that. Uh, but, I mean, the biggest thing is, as I alluded to, what came out of our co-pilot program is communication. It's this, the same sort of problem that, that patients may have with how communication happens between the providers and them as the same thing that can happen between different groups of physicians or other you know, physicians and administrators or I'm sure in, in any other area that we can think of. I, I think Bill probably has something to say about this with competing values framework. But before you add that bit, I'll, I'll just say that I think part of how I've grown as a designer is initially I, I understood my role as a facilitator to help kind of resolve conflict. Uh, just like I, I would think of it, uh, of ambiguity as we have to you know, make sense of the ambiguity. What I've really learned as I've grown into this is that there's a place for creative abrasion, right? There's a place where you're using that thing, whether it's ambiguity or that, that friction, and you're turning it into traction to get even further. And, and we do that, we have a very specific way of doing that that Bill is probably better at describing than I am. Yeah, one thing we do in, in several of the courses we teach is um, use Cameron and Quinn's competing values framework. And Dr. Jeff DeGraff at Michigan has taken that framework and bought it into the innovation space. And the idea is that we all have, uh, I, I call it a superpower just because I'm a Marvel DP, DC fan, but we all have something we do very well. And it tends to be one of four things. We're either the creative or we're kind of the athlete or we're the people person or we're the engineer, the person that loves the rules and knows the rules. The problem is that there's an X right across the middle. So the creative and the engineer have tension. And the fact is you need both of those. The creative is the one that has the great idea, usually. They're also ideaholics and they have 120 ideas a, you know, a, a day. Um, but the engineer is the one that's gonna say, yeah, but the AFI or the legal review says X. But that friction, to your point, Toga, that friction is also where the energy comes from. So once we get to know what we're good at and that we are good at that, um, like, you know, that, that, that engineer, you're never going to get to scale unless you understand the rules because what the rules do is make it repeatable and now you have a process and now you can follow the process, you know, but you can't do anything unless you have a great idea. So that competing values framework is really interesting, I think, in, in how do we look at those people that might tend to rub us the wrong way. So, so you're talking about kind of our dominant way of solving problems. And sir, you talked about like the changes you've seen in medicine, uh, but internally, I'm like, what are the changes you've seen in yourself? Like, you know, I kind of went, alluded to this in my first question, but specifically you said you spent a lot of time uh, where you know, the right side of your brain was hurting by the time <laughs> that you were over, uh, you know, with that, with that season of your life. Uh, I know personally I found that I, I feel like I get better at these things through practice. So by the end of that time, did you feel like you were stronger with those right brain things? Um, I think that's still a process in evolution. Okay, fair enough. Um, it's not something that I do every day. Uh, you know, what I do every day is very, you know, left brain, very, uh, you know, rote specific, um, but not as creative thinking. There are aspects uh, to it that are, but it's certainly something that I can continue to work on. Um, I think it did help me from an empathy standpoint and especially dealing with patients and to recognize that, you know, whereas I thought I was always putting them first in many ways or not. Like we think about things, you know, having blood drawn at four o'clock in the morning while patients are in the hospital. You know, at times it's important so that we know we have these results back before we go to the OR and can make decisions for their day. But at times it's there 
for our convenience. Well, that's not fair to the patient. So it did open my eyes to a lot of those things. And, it, it, you know, and I do have to stop myself frequently and step back and say, you know, who's at the center here? Right. So I do want to give time for everyone to kind of give their closing comments. But so we have time for at least one more question. Is there anything else from the crowd? I've got a question for, for both of you. Uh -oh. So, Go so how, you know, uh, other things that you've used, you know, design thinking for in your work uh, space. We'll get, how about a, one really good example from each of you about how how you've used it to solve a problem here? You want that first? Oh, uh, sure. I think <laughs> I'll take a hack. Well, <laughs> I my first experience again was uh, the Stanford model. So. For me, that was my design thinking hammer, and every problem was a nail that needed the, the mm -hmm. hexagons at first, right? And then I kind of grew and learned that uh, you know not every problem is amenable to a human-centered design, but even when it's not, we're always doing things by and through and with people. So there's always humans involved, and so there's always a, a use, I think, for tending to the team, even if the team is doing something very technical, uh, that that team is made of humans, and we need to tend to that, uh, before we get going. So uh, one asked, the way that was manifested most recently for me is I got to lead the team that designed concepts for Space Force professional military education. And it was very clear to me at the beginning that the normal demographics of the groups that I work with where it's, it's very playful and we start off with a lot of exercises, a lot of things that you, you know from IDEO and Stanford. You know, we're gonna play rock, paper, scissors, we're gonna do all these games. That, that was not what this team needed in that moment. And we, in fact, had to design the design while we were designing. So it wasn't just, oh, we're gonna run through, you know, empathy, define, ideate, prototype, and test, but that we needed different language even because, uh, you know, instead of calling it empathy, we called it discovery work. And we, and we had to figure out ways where the design team was more comfortable and then the people we were delivering the, the ideas to, we, we, they had a, even a different definition of what design meant. So we, we had to empathize with them to know that when they hear design, they mean this, but we really mean that. Let's put it in terms of doctrine is what we did. Because we were talking to senior leaders of the Space Force, mm -hmm. and, and doctrine is the way we do things. That's, that's our don't deviate unless you have a good reason, right? That's our doctrine. And so we said, well, you know, when they say doctrine, they say operational approach. That's essentially the same thing as the concept we're trying to get to. So we just call things operational approaches. And that was a way that we could get uh, their buy-in without immediately sort of creating some sort of resistance that what we were doing was, was different. So, and, I, and I credit that, even though we didn't use a full design thinking process, I credit those type of judgments to what I had learned and applying design thinking you know, more structurally at different times. That's great. Yeah, so we, we teach a course called Innovators by Design. And we did, this is our fourth year, next will be our fifth year. And uh, we had three amazing projects that came out of the course this year. But, but one that has got traction um, in the Air Force right now was by a major who's a JAG that wanted to tackle racial disparity in the military justice system. And so, you know, I believe that design thinking can solve a lot of problems. But when he threw that one out there, I was like, uh, <laughs> yeah, let's go back and look at those hexagons and, and have a conversation. But uh, I would tell you that, that by following the design thinking process and by digging really deep, he has a very interesting way to tackle uh, this issue for the US Air Force, so much so that he got to talk to the Vice Chief of Staff of the Air Force a few weeks ago, and the Vice Chief really liked what he was saying. So between the Vice Chief General Alvin and General Hecker, they've kind of given him a runway now to figure out, hey, will your process really work? So he pitched it, he's got a prototype, and now he's got some traction to go do it. So that was a real big one that I think was pretty impressive. So we're gonna wrap up here in about seven minutes, but uh, we'll just start from Bill and go this way. Uh, closing comments about design thinking or the relationship between medicine and the military or any insights you wanna share? No, I just wanna say thank you. Thank you for everyone in the audience and, and online and thank you, Dr. Katz. Um, I, I do think it's fascinating when sometimes we sit in our stovepipe that might be the military, it might, it might be the, the school we work at at AU, but we think that's where it's at. So I think what you did was open the aperture to say it's not just the military that has these issues. Look at something like medicine. Let's start looking at the commonalities between the military and medicine and the things that we can learn from each other. So thank you very much. Yeah, no, and, and thank you for having me. I, I, I really 
need to echo your sentiments is that in, in a lot of ways there is a tremendous amount of, of crossover between the military and medicine and some of the problems. Um, you know, in the military, uh, you're worried about your own lives, obviously, and the, as well as those of others. In medicine, we're taking risks with other people's lives, really, more than our own. But nonetheless, each has serious consequences. And um, so what we do and how we do it and being sure that we get the message out and get the best thing done for the most people is really what we're all after. And, and I, I, I like a lot of the things that I've heard here about what you all have done and know, learning to speak the language of the people that you're dealing with is huge. Um, we all may be speaking English, but we're coming from different places. And, uh, and that's the only way we're ever going to get anywhere is to be able to communicate appropriately. Yeah, thanks. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. uh, before I ask uh, the SOS Commandant to come up here in a moment uh, to say thank you on behalf of our school, uh, thanks personally. This has, been, this has been fun. It's been fun to interact mm -hmm. with you. I, I think it's been a great example of you know, what Bill just mentioned about reaching across, and, and I think of this as being undisciplined by design, right? We, we, we have academic disciplines that we tend to have a, a paradigmatic way of thinking and what constitutes valid knowledge, uh, and design is really about reaching across, whether it's an academic discipline, whether it's different domains, medicine and military, whether it's even within medicine, you talked about the difference between private practice mm -hmm. and, and being in an academic setting. And I think we, we gain a lot from these conversations that we can have between different groups and we kind of steal like an artist between each other, Absolutely. right? And, uh, and then we get, we get further because it goes back to creative abrasion and competing value framework and the power of diversity and, and all those things. So again, I think today is a great example of that and I appreciate that. And uh, right now I'd like to ask uh, Colonel Rosie Miranda to come up. Could, uh, Colonel Rosie Miranda is our, our commandant here at Squadron Officer School. Hey, so uh, the Teaching and Learning Center uh, really is a wonderful spot to engage in civil conversation. Uh, so sometimes I'm going to ask a lot of questions. Uh, here at, at SOS, I've seen the significance of quality in the teaching of uh, Islamic uh, doctrine and, and really think it's an incredibly important part of the school uh, as well. Thank you very much. Enjoyed being here. It's a real honor. Um, I've learned a lot from you all. I want to thank Megan Hennessy Croy for bringing this up, and I'm sorry that she couldn't be here today, but this has been great. And uh, as I said, you know, knowing that there are people like you working on the issues and helping protect all of us will help me sleep better at night. Thanks.